Hello. Okay. Um, okay. Welcome to uh, introducing ResNOS, the operating system uh, for the embedded world and containers. Um, so, who who are we? Um, I'm uh, Peter Sanzelatos, and my colleague here, Andre Gerson, will do the presentation together. Um, he's the lead developer of the of ResNOS and also the maintainer of Meta Raspberry Pi and the meta chip for the chip uh, board. And I'm the founder and CEO of Resin, uh, the company behind uh, Resin OS. Um, and I was involved with the original work of porting Docker to, to ARM. Um, so today we'll talk about uh, what is our mission and why did we uh, even build an operating system, um, <coughs> some history, and that's not gonna work. Um, um, the architecture of our operating system, um, some notable features uh, we implemented and development tools um, that a, a developer can use for uh, developing on ResNOS with containers and how do we see the fu future of that operating system. Um, all these slides will be uploaded and we have uh, GitHub links all over the, the slides that will point you to the right repos uh, for a particular component that we're talking about. Um, so what, are, what is our mission? Um, so we, uh, we believe that containers have some unique capabilities um, in development. So you can have really fast iteration. Um, embedded developers are used to changing their code and rebooting the board, so containers uh, are uh, a lot easier to use, and another thing is that um, the if, if the projected numbers of Internet of Things devices that will be around in a few years is correct, then uh, a lot of developers that are not currently embedded developers will start using and, and developing for the embedded world, and they're used to uh, a lot more different tools. Uh, so we're trying to bridge the two worlds, the worlds of uh, modern DevOps and, and Docker with the embedded world. Um, so containers um, is a very well understood concept in the in the cloud world, but there are some unique challenges when you try to apply them into uh, the embedded world. Um, so, for example, a container in the cloud um, deals with some virtualized resources like uh, CPU and memory and storage, and it doesn't really care if that's a virtual CPU or a normal CPU, if it's in a KVM or not. But on an embedded platform, you might want to interact with hardware. And so the container abstraction kind of breaks there, so you have to take special care to um, sometimes allow uh, uh, hardware access um, when, when, when it's needed. Um, also, uh, containers, uh, well, that's generally uh, the case that uh, networking on, on embedded devices is far more uh, weirder than in the cloud, so you can have uh, devices in poor network conditions, you can have uh, device with 3G and all this stuff. So again, we had to, to take special care there to make sure <coughs> uh, Docker works um, under these conditions. And another another big part of our mission is making the operating system a friendly place for a developer to work on. So uh, we're also providing some tools that will make that easier. <coughs> So the history of Resin uh, OS, so we, the Resin IO is a company, so whenever I say Resin IO, I mean the company, and Resin OS is a uh, project we're, that, we're open, that we're releasing today, we didn't open, open source it today. Um, so we started four years ago, and the reason we are, were involved with the, uh, the embedded stuff was we were managing uh, 200 devices in the city of London for two years, and we, we found most of, our, of the tooling available for that job to be pretty primitive and a pretty hard problem. So we were spending a lot of time uh, developing for the infrastructure rather than our product. So uh, at some point we said, let's, let's try and fix it. Um, and so this is how Resin IO the platform was born. And to make Resin IO the platform a thing, we needed to have a, an operating system that we would run our devices. Um, so 
in the beginning, we were wondering how we should go about that, and we tried various things. We tried uh, modifying an Arc Linux distribution. We tried modifying TinyCore we had. Uh, the requirement was to have a minimal thing that we could port to a lot of devices. Um, but both of these approaches were, were uh, limited, and we figured it out pretty pretty soon. Um, so we uh, finally settled on on Yocto on the on January two thousand four. Um, we open sourced uh, the the code in um, a bit more than a year ago in July two thousand fifteen, and it, ha it has been in very active development. And we've been running uh, that in production for uh, two point five years, uh, and it's been running on thousands of devices. Um, so this presentation is, so today um, we are more or less detaching resin OS from being a component that's uh, being purpose-built purpose for uh, using it in the resin IO platform and making it, making it a separate component that somebody can, can run uh, on his own without needing to do anything to do, without having, it, having anything to do with the resin IO platform. So all of the uh, knowledge we've learned, all the uh, problems we've solved uh, that can be leveraged for other applications. So I'll start with uh, uh, going through the architecture. Uh, actually, Andre, if you want to go through this part. Um, so we'll go through the architecture um, of our platform um, and how we build the operating system uh, what is uh, what what's, what the runtime looks like? Um, some challenges that we had to overcome. Hi everyone, I'm Andre. Um, so um, first of all, why do you choose Yocto? Because our build system of choice right now is Yocto. And uh, we are using it basically because it's minimal. It has a uh, low footprint, uh, and it, it allows easy patching. That basically we can stack we can stack layers, and then uh, we can advertise them as being hardware specific or not. And then based on it, we can add patches that are specific to boards, or they are just generalized ac across all the boards. Board ve vendors usually supply Yocto uh, BSP. They tend to be kind of a unified or accepted way of delivering BSPs nowadays. Freescale does it uh, all the time. All droids do that. Raspberry Pi uh, has the community uh, across BSPs, uh, Yocto BSPs, and so on. Uh, so uh, device support comes pretty easy. Obviously, we still have to patch it. We still have to configure. But we have kind of out-of-the-box um, experience with uh, both supports. Um, how do we structure this? Uh, we basically have for each device a resin board repository, which is a collection of submodules, and it gives you a setup of a build. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Yocto builds, or have you done one before? Can you raise your hands? Oh, basically everyone. <laughs> okay, so uh, we define a resin board uh, repository. We create submodules sub that are basically dependencies of the build, and then we stack different layers. We have the meta resin, which is the core operating system, and then we have a meta resin board, for example, meta resin Raspberry Pi, which are changes specific to that to that to that board. Uh, and obviously, we, we have Pokey and Meta OE, so the de dependencies that are, are for the operating system. So one repo per board. Why do we do that? Because we want to make sure that we can um, we, we we don't affect builds and we don't. We don't, by mistake, change or append recipes from another layer because there is a bug or something in, in the BB append, for example, something like that. So we we want we want them separated. Uh, Submodule for dependent layers. I always say that, and each board can move independently. Um, okay, so Meta Resin, it's uh, our uh, main resin OS layer. It's basically the common part of all our um, of, all, of all our supported boards. Um, it has it has a lot of features. I will mention here automatic uh, AUFS patching. Patching that is 
we uh, develop a mechanism where we pull and match the current version of kernel with patches of AUFS. We pull them, we apply them after the patch task, and we roll the build. Uh, we obviously detect if the kernel supplied by the BSP already has the AUFS support, so we, we just, yeah, use it if it's there. Um, can pre-populate pre uh, Docker images, that means you can preload from Yocto directly an image on your device. So for example, you want to create a, a build that has, let's say, Ubuntu on it as, as a Docker image. You'd be able to do it in the build system so you don't have to waste time downloading on the target afterwards. So preloaded Docker images, kernel headers for out of the three uh, module development. Obviously, when you have a device, you you want to you wanna develop stuff, and s some of the things are uh, kernel modules. So you need, you need uh, Simverse, you need configuration of the kernel, you have kernel headers, so, so you can build your, your, your modules over that. So it looks like that. MetaResin has a MetaResin common, which is, which is the part that is common across all the versions of Yocto, and then specific layers for each supported Yocto version that we have right now. We support DAISY. Probably that, yeah. so, some, so some of you I've seen laughing, uh, but we do that because we have we have a board called Edison, Intel Edison, and they tend to be pretty pretty bad in in support. I, I hope I don't hurt anyone, but that, that's how it is. And then Jetro and and Fido, which are kind of well, Jetro is it's it's used on probably all the other boards right now. And Fido is just the one that we used to to have before, and we're keeping it that for in case some other boards that come and want support come with BSP for that specific version, so we just keep it for future support. Um, yeah, build system. As, as a build system, uh, we use uh, an environment predefined in a Docker file. So what we do, we, we run all our builds in a, in, a, in, a, in a container, so we have all the requirements, host configuration predictable. We don't, ha we don't have to uh, redeploy a new server and reconfigure everything. We just have a new uh, container and everything goes goes inside. Um, Docker image artifacts. Um, um, what we do, we we use our OS as a, our operating system as a container. So we push this container to Docker to Docker Hub under under that um, under that um, uh, link uh, handle. And basically, you will have the entire user space pushed to a Docker image. Okay, partition layout. We use a separate rootfs and um, root state partitions. Um, so in this way, we can, we can catch any write to rootfs, and basically, we um, know exactly which services write to disk, we, we have a, a, a dual root partition. We do that for um, updates. So we'll be able to switch A, B, mechanism, green, blue, whatever you want to call it. We use that for, for, for that. Uh, data partition, partition auto expands on first boot. You don't want to burn eight gigs of, of, of disk. You just want to uh, burn whatever you need. And then the first boot will expand to the end of the disk. And not only that, sometimes you don't know exactly what are you going to use as, as a, as a size of the device, so it, it will just automatically increase to the, to the limit. Um, Read-only read -only root. One of the biggest uh, struggles uh, that, that we, we, had to we, we had to overcome over time was mutation of the rootfs, and that is try to keep things as pristine as, as possible so we can do updates easily. We don't have conflicts, we don't have to uh, transfer things across updates and so on and so forth. So what, what we do, we, we uh, started to, to use read-only root FSs and we catch all the, all the writes. Um, and in order, well, well the, the system still needs to write things on the root FS. So we have two different solutions. If, if, if it's a state, uh, if it's a state write, then everything goes through a bind mode to the state partition. If it's not a state, uh, or it's transistent uh, state, we use t TMFS. And uh, configure uh, stored in, in a state partition, those are persistent ones, uh, we, we um, list this uh, here, network configuration, 
randomcy, the systemd randomcy, we want to persist it across, across updates, clock a shutdown, um, and for, for, the other, for the other transist and temporary uh, state, we list here the ACP lists and limited logs. Um, yeah, uh, read-only read um, root gives us a couple of features. Uh, it gives us a cleaner separation. It gives us OTA uh, updates, which are super simple now because we don't have we have we don't have uh, mutations. Uh, it gives us, it enables us the possibility of this uh, diff-based updates. So on the server offline, we can we can uh, compute the, the binary diff in between the two images and then push and apply on a device. Um, and we we it, it doesn't it doesn't give us the the problem of leaving the state behind. That is, we have to transfer configuration across updates. We have to handle all the uh, files that were modified and transfer them on, on the new on the new update. Okay, and yeah. I'll talk about. Um, so the architecture of the of the partition layout um, has some other interesting properties. So one of them is the compartmentalization of failures. Um, in in the state in the system that we presented, the data partition is where Docker containers are installed and run, and so most of the I/O activity will be happening on that partition, which is separate from the root partition, and therefore the um, the likelihood of, of a failure happening would be in that partition, and the device can definitely survive uh, file system corruption there. Um, the root partition is never written to while while in, uh, while in use, but also uh, when we when we didn't update, uh, not only we, we will write a new update to disk uh, and and sync it, but we will also read it back and verify its exams just to make sure um, that it's been written correctly. Um, also, whenever we have to do changes in the state partition, uh, we make sure we do that in an atomic fashion. So uh, we will always do a, a temporary file and, and rename thing uh, whenever we have to change stuff. Um, so this is an overview of the build system and the partition layout. Um, now I'd like to go through the uh, runtime, um, how, how the runtime looks on that operating system. So uh, in this diagram, uh, the gen generally the developers will be working on the blue uh, squares, which is the container, uh, and ResinMS is what takes care of everything and the green boxes. Um, so the, the goal of the operating system is to be fully updatable. And by having this separation, you essentially have two uh, different speeds uh, and two different methods of updating. Um, so in the container, you have a full user space and you can do updates uh, as fast as you want, as often as you want, without really caring uh, if they work or not. Even, even if you push a container that it's completely broken, uh, the host will still be there for you to uh, send the next update that fixes the problem. Um, and so uh, the user space below that is, uh, we're purposely making it uh, do as less as possible. So the, the goal for the, for the user space is to bring the board up, connect to the network, and enable uh, containers. So, and that's all it does. Um, and so uh, while we have the fast updates for the containers, we, st we still have the ability to update the user space uh, using the double root partition method, but that happens a lot more infrequently than uh, container updates. Um, so this is the list of ingredients. Um, it's not a, an exhaustive list, obviously. Uh, these are just some highlights. So uh, we're based on the systemd uh, network manager and modem manager for networking. Uh, modern monitor for 3G support. Dropware for SSH, DNS mask for handling DNS. Docker obviously for containers and Avahi for uh, for the development tools, which we'll talk later. Um, so some uh, why did we again why why did we choose uh, System E? <coughs> Excuse me. So. Initially, we were based uh, on CSV init, um, which is a, a default init system of Yocto, but we quickly found ourselves having a hard time managing dependencies <coughs> sometimes. 
uh, restarting a service would leave uh, processes behind, um, and then its pro program was trying to manage its own logging. Um, and so when we shoot systemd, we had a lot of these uh, problems uh, solved. Um, and, and then we started taking advantage of uh, some other features that we can get, uh, so we can easily define uh, out of memory score for critical services. So if you if your container gets out of memory, the system will not kill your network manager, for example, um, or running some services in separate mount namespaces. Uh, we do that particularly for Docker. Um, we don't really need to. Uh, uh, dependency management is handled very nicely, and we're also using some of the utility feature features that it has. So. Um, NTP, we're using the systemd time sync D for that. <coughs> Socket activation was also something we took advantage of. So while you can do SSH on your board, um, it will only run when, it, when you actually connect to it. And there are some, there are a lot of more, more features that we're planning of taking advantage of in the future. Um, so uh, on the networking side, uh, the things are a bit more interesting. So I mentioned that in the beginning that um, networking in the data center is pretty predictable, but we found out that the networking um, is pretty uh, broken when you go outside the data center. And so the <coughs> normal resolver of uh, libc is very, very limited. So it supports three name servers. It will try to resolve uh, one by one what you have in your uh, resolve conf file. And we've seen networks where the DHCP DNS would be broken, uh, or the Google DNS would be blocked, or the uh, uh, DHCP DNS will take forever to resolve, and it would be blocking forever. Um, or they would have <coughs> more than three DNS servers available and all this kind of stuff. And so for this reason, um, we included DNS mask in our operating system, uh, which has a very, very intelligent way of handling DNS. So we'll try things in parallel and choose the best uh, DNS server and periodically re-establish which DNS server to use, and we also use and we also integrate Docker uh, to uh, direct all the container uh, DNS requests to that host resolver. Um, on the network manager, we were really interested in the uh, DBus API. Um, so everything you can do, everything. Uh, you can do with configuration files on the network manager, you can do through the Dbus API. Same goes for modem manager. And this is really important because when you're running inside a container, sometimes you want to interact with the system on the host and, for example, ask what are the available Wi-Fi access points. And so having a Dbus API, which you have access to just through a socket, it's a very clean way of uh, doing that through the container. Um, So Docker, well, which is the main component that enables running containers. Uh, so we mentioned that we are automatically passing the kernels with AUFS. Um, this was a hard choice to make because AUFS is not a mainline uh, file system. However, the, the choices we had are, were pretty limited. So the other options for Docker would be uh, overlay FS, but that would require a fairly new kernel, 3.18 or newer. Uh, and the overlay storage driver of Docker uses a large number of, <coughs> of inodes, uh, which was fixed with the overlay 2 driver, but, re but that requires an even newer kernel. And the other options were BitRFS, Device Mapper, or ZFS, which pretty much rule out any non based device. Uh, and we wanted to be able to support non based devices. So this is the reason we are now on AUFS. Um, we have backported some stability patches of Docker. So uh, th these are already on the Docker uh, source code, but not on version 1.10. Uh, but basically, uh, they allow you to have atomic operations on the file system level, uh, so that when, if you pull the power, the power plug, you will not end up in a weird state. And, and the journal driver is also another important thing. Um, so Docker by default uh, will run your container and will catch the standard out of your process and anything you write to your, to your standard output will be logged in a JSON file on disk. So that was really bad for 
SD card um, where or flash flash memory where, and by integrating uh, the journal D backend driver, uh, everything goes to journal D, and we have a central pl place there we c where we can control um, if the logs will stay in RAM, how much of them will stay in RAM, or if it'll we have much more control on, on the logs there. Um, and another thing is that we also enable SecComp on any uh, board that w is built with Meta Resin, <coughs> and Docker will take advantage of, th advantage of that and will run the container with a default uh, SecComp profile. So log management. Um, so we we tr we try to uh, don't allow any program to write its own logs. Um, we send everything to journal D, um, and by default we uh, have an eight megabyte buffer in memory. So that means that if you if your device has an, has an issue and you pull the power out, there is there are no logs to inspect on the SD card, or if you boot it back up. So we also offer an we offer an option to persist the logs uh, if you want to debug something. Um, and also, the all the logs that go to journal D from Docker are annotated with the container they came from, so you can do uh, uh, pretty complex queries and, and find out uh, where the logs are coming from. Um, and another important thing is by having a central place where all the logs go, uh, if you, and that, and that is a, uh, particularly important in use cases that we see in from our customers when you have a fleet of devices um, deployed you want you probably want to be sending a stream of logs back to for stores and and maybe uh, run some analytics on them and uh, so having a central place where everything goes is very helpful to accomplish that all right um, so Based on on these components um, the, on the operating system, we've we've built some some features. Um, actually, the first feature I want to talk about is not is part of Meta Resin. Uh, so some boards uh, like the BeagleBone or an Intel Nuke will have internal storage, and the normal approach of Yocto is that you build your image and it produces a root file system, but then it's your problem uh, to find a way to uh, flash it on, your, on the internal storage. Um, and so with MetaResin, you can redefine an image class which basically creates <coughs> and creates a, um, a bootable image that will copy itself into the internal storage so you don't have to, uh, you, you don't have to do that manually. Um, and it would, it would provide feedback through LEDs on the device. Um, Another important thing uh, is hostess updates, um, and there are a large amount of options, and uh, a lot of people are talking about it in, in this uh, conference as well. So um, it's an area where we spend a lot of uh, thinking and engineering on, uh, and Resin Hub is our current approach. However, uh, it's definitely still under development, so uh, don't expect a uh, production ready polish solution. Um, so our current approach basically is taking advantage of the partition layout that we've chosen uh, in Meta Resin, and uh, and do the updates by putting the new version in the inactive partition, validate everything, change the bootloader, and and reboot the device. Um, some uh, so this method is used by a lot of projects. Um, However, it's it's costly storage-wise, so you have to have double double the space to do the updates. And so we are experimenting with some more advanced techniques, which um, which will reuse space for files that haven't changed in the case of OS3, or it will reuse space for common layers in the case of Docker. Um, and specifically, the integration with Docker in Resin Hub. Um, we, we thought so. Resin, when you, when you do an operating system update, we, you essentially have to download uh, a new user space and put it in your inactive root partition. And doing that with a tar archive when you have Docker was felt felt wrong. 
So Docker is a tool where you can, I mean, a container, a container image is a user space um, fa file system. And this connects to the uh, build artifact that Andre mentioned in the beginning. So when, when we do a build of uh, a meta resin device, we push to Docker Hub the version of the operating system as a Docker image, which we then utilize on, uh, at the time of update to pull on, on the target. And so Resin Hub will use Docker to pull the, uh, the new update. It will unpack it um, and do the update. Now this opens up the, the door for, um, for utilizing other Docker features. Uh, for example, you can have signed images and you, you don't have to implement it yourself. Um, we also have a pretty good programmatic API for um, managing, fetching the images, uh, managing which are installed. And an open question but we are again thinking a lot of is, uh, can we unify the containers and the host operating system? And so if you, if you think about it, if, if you think about it, um, in the data partition, you basically have multiple sysroots whenever you pull a container. So it could be, it should be possible to, to boot into one of them which is similar to OS3 as well. Um, other features which have to do with how we develop the operating system is that we have a lot of uh, automated testing around the, 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 the board. So we're moving fast, but then we also have to test. So we're, we've taken two approaches here. One is the automated, autom automatic emulated testing. And so we have uh, two QEMU targets that we uh, that we use to uh, test on every pull request that the new version of Meta Resin will boot, uh, that the network is working and it's integrated with our Jenkins uh, system. And the other is that the automated hardware testing, and we've built this uh, small uh, piece of hardware which you can find schematics for in that repo. And it basically allows you to instrument a board and let's say a Raspberry Pi and so you can have a programmatic API that says, uh, write these things into the SD card, now power on, power on the board, now uh, uh, pull up this GPIO, now check this GPIO. So you, ha you basically have a programmatic API to, uh, on a device, and with this one you can, we can do a lot more advanced testing. We can see if the provisioning works, we can see if the Wi-Fi works, um, and all kinds of stuff. Um, these are the current, this is the current list of devices we support. Uh, there are currently 22, I think. Um, and most of them are ARM v7, but we've, uh, we have at least one candidate for all these architectures. And the important thing which also mentioned, was also mentioned in the beginning is that um, by, by having, uh, by using Yocta, but also the way we structured Meta Resin and its abstractions, it's fairly easy to add a new board. And we, we really, really try to um, make the, ch the, cha the board specific changes required to support the board as few as possible. Um, so Meta Resin will handle all this stuff for you. Um, and again, this is important for, I guess, bigger projects that will uh, prototype on a Raspberry Pi or will prototype on another board and at some point will uh, move on and build their own custom board. Now for development tools, um, so um, normally again you if you if you build a, an image uh, there is a question of how how do you develop on that image uh, so for example how do you put the Wi-Fi credentials in your image or how do you provision it how do you uh, run your code in there and get back the logs. Um, so we had to build some tools around that. Um, when you build a resin OS image in development mode, it will do these things for you. So it will, it will run an S8 server <coughs> with, no, with no password so you can connect on your local network. And it will also expose the Docker socket over TCP so you can run Docker commands remote, remotely. And it will also use MDNS to publish uh, its existence uh, under the uh, hostname.local uh, domain name. And we've built some tools that are based on these things. Uh, the tool is called Resin Device Toolbox. 
Um, and it basically allo allows you to do uh, three categories of things. One is configuring the image. The second one is uh, flashing the image. And the third one is uh, helping you do it during development. And so uh, in, in this example, I've run uh, RDT configure, and I've passed the path to uh, a resin image. And it will, in, it will interrogate me uh, on the terminal for uh, the Wi-Fi credentials, for example, or if I want to set the host name. And then we'll, it will persist these changes in the image. Um, as the next step, I will ask it to uh, flash the image to the SD card or the USB drive. Again, obviously you can do that with DD as well, but the uh, the good thing about this method is it will try really hard not to select a hard drive, um, and will also validate the. I see somebody laughing, but uh, this has happened to me I'm for sure, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people have killed their hard drives uh, with DD. Uh, but it will also validate the uh, the SD card back. So some SD cards will corrupt the thing as you write it, and you will find out much later. So this is also an added bonus. Um, and another thing we want to integrate into the process is, <coughs> is BMAPs. And so the write process will become faster by skipping uh, unrelated sectors of, of the image. And during development, uh, and this is, I guess, the most important command, uh, the RDT push, uh, you have, who has done Docker development here? few people. Uh, so um, if you have your source code, uh, which generally will include a Docker file and uh, some other source code, by running this command on your source directory, it will um, discover the resin OS device on your network. Um, it will connect to the Docker socket <coughs> and, and push your, uh, and build your Docker file. And, and then it will run your container and give you back, give, give you back the logs. But at the same time, it will start an iNotify uh, watcher on your repo. And whenever you change files, it will automatically rsync them directly into your container and restart the container. So you get uh, a fast iteration uh, cycle. Um, and as a special case, if you, if you change your Docker file, it will figure it out and it will rebuild your Docker file. Um, now, a question is, uh, where do you find all these images to develop for? Uh, for a ResNOS device. So we're also having a fairly big uh, uh, library of base images. Um, so uh, um, there, there are the ResNOS uh, Docker images that we mentioned at the beginning, but these are pretty uh, primitive in terms of developments because you get a Yocta user space. So we're also providing uh, base images for all these devices for, that have a Debian, Fedora, or, or Alpine user space. And for each one of them, we have an, an Node.js, Python, Golang, and Java um, variants, which basically include all the development tools for that particular framework. Uh, and they're, they're mostly based on the Docker base images, um, and they follow the conventions. Um, but we've also added some features there that have to do with <coughs> running containers on embedded devices. Um, so, the future, um, as we as we see it, um, has uh, a lot of a lot of things. This is just a a list uh, of things that we're thinking about, but it's definitely um, uh, there are a lot of more things uh, that have to be done. Uh, so, compressed RAM and secure boot and watchdog integration, uh, newer Docker versions. Um, all of these things are things that are needed, um, and there is uh, there is lots of room for innovation. I think uh, on on such an operating system, and we're definitely interested in your thoughts and what would you uh, expect from from such an operating system. And obviously, everything we I've presented so far um, that also had these GitHub links. Uh, underneath is open source, so you can find uh, you can find builds of ResNOS in the website. It was uh, released. It was online two hours ago, so it's really fresh. Um, you can find all our code, uh, all the uh, layers, uh, 
the uh, the other hat in our GitHub uh, Resin OS, and you can also chat with us in the Resin uh, OS Gitter channel. And we're using Apache 2 license for all our code. And uh, yeah, we'll be more than happy to talk to you. All right. Um, do you have any questions? Yes. So the, uh, the the server the the fleet management is uh, what the what we do in the Resin IO platform. So we're using the operating system to manage that. Um, you can the the Resin IO uh, platform is not open source currently, but we are <coughs> we're planning to open source that part as well. Uh, so today, um, what I would do is uh, run uh, an open VPN server on on a ResNest device and have it connect to a server of mine and then you could take it from there. Yes, uh, I believe there is a, I, I think I can upload them in, they're online? No. Yeah, I'll put them on the, on the page of the event. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, for for our purposes, we we have done that for <coughs> some components. So um, in the when we use Resin OS in in the in in our product, there is one container that we built, and we use Yocto to build a container. Uh, so it's definitely possible, and actually it produces. A really, really small container that we. The, 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 our main motivation there was not custom libraries, but it was the size of the container, and uh, uh, it was the best option we had, and it's definitely uh, a viable path. Yeah. Um, so. It, for the con for container, it depends on your on on your base image. So if your if your base image is a Debian base image and you do a lot of upkit installs in there, you'll uh, fairly quickly go uh, I don't know in, in the hundreds of megabytes. Uh, so uh, basing doing that becomes a big uh, user space. Your your other option, uh, and that depends also on the, on the language you want to run. Um, so if you have, for example, a GoLang project. Uh, you can do you can build your Golang binary uh, and just have a Docker image with a Docker binary with the Golang binary. So that would be really small. Um, also, you can do what uh, what he said about uh, creating a Docker image based on Yocto. So the for these all, all, all these numbers were for containers. Our operating system currently has uh, 300 megabytes uh, uh, size for its partition. Um, there are definitely ways of uh, shrinking that. I mean, it's it's been on purpose over provisioned. Um, one of our biggest challenges is uh, Docker. So the Docker binary currently, if you want to include Docker 112, the all the binaries are 60 megs, I think, in total. So this is the biggest contributor in size in our file system. Um, but we we have ways of uh, getting that down to 20. So it will it will be a lot smaller. And again, the the fact that we do dual root partition updates means that we get double usage from that. So finding a way forward on that front will also reduce the space requirements. Yeah. We we actually had to look on a lot of stuff. So there is there are a lot of ways of running containers. Uh, we've looked even in using Docker to build a container, and then translating that into an OS3 <laughs> deployment, and then run the container with uh, systemd and spawn. <coughs> 
or uh, the recent run C. The problem with all these is that um, when when a developer uses uh, such an operating system, he will almost certainly expect the Docker API to be there. And so, if you if you want to uh, provide the Docker API, you have no other option other than running the Docker daemon. Um, I'm not sure if, we, if we're gonna ever abstract that in the future, so you can interchange container. Uh, um, managers, uh, but currently, yeah, it's uh, Docker specific. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So SquashFS was a. Uh, we thought about that. the The main issue with SquashFS that we have is that we want to do uh, diff updates. Uh, and if you if you compress a file system um, with SquashFS, then if you change uh, if you change part of the file system because of the compression, the byte the bit stream changes a lot, so the diffs become uh, basically non-existent, and so we will lose the the benefit of bandwidth reduction uh, on that front. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, you can have it as a stack, but then where does the stack end? <laughs> okay. Um, maybe. I, I, but that was the, the rationale behind that. All right. Thank you very much.